We're going to continue looking in the book of Romans this morning. <coughs> Even though Sarah thought Adam gave me some Sunday school material yesterday, but <laughs> we're good. Look, Lord willing, in verses 6 and 7 of Romans chapter 1. Here Paul is continuing on the same thought from verse 5, and he says, Among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ? To all that be in Rome, the love of God, called to be saints, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And that you know, he begins us with, Among whom are ye also this is referring back to verse 5 when he says, Among all the nations for his name, if you remember from last week, Paul was given the ministry of the apostleship to go unto the Gentiles. And he says that these Romans here, they were among those nations. They were most certainly a Gentile nation. Mm -hmm. Really just the same, we are part of those as well, part of those Gentile nations whom Paul was given his apostleship to. <clears throat> and even in a more spiritual sense, we were among the nations of the world before the Lord saved us. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that we walked according to the prince of power of the air. Our nature was as a children of wrath, even as others. You're right. Amen. Before the Lord saved us, we were as the world, but yet Galatians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4 tell us that Christ gave himself that he might set, deliver us from this present evil world. Amen. We are in this world, but we are not to be a part of it. We are among the nations of this world, we really are not identified with them. Amen. He says, We were, he says, Among whom are ye also the call of Jesus Christ? The call of Jesus Christ is the saved, if you will. He'll expound upon a little bit more in the next verse. Jude, verse 1, clearly states that the call are the same as the saved. Turn over there for just a moment. Jude verse 1 says, Jude, servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Amen. Amen. Well, the call are also preserved in Christ and also sanctified by God because that is a mark of the same that we're sanctified by God, preserved in Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. There is a, an invitation, I guess you could say, in the gospel that goes out to all. God commandeth all men everywhere to repent, but, but to be the called is that effectual call. Amen. Call the one that actually reaches down and touches the heart to the ear. That is the call of Jesus Christ. Christ in his own ministry said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. That is to be called of Christ. Mm -hmm. First Peter 2, 9, 2 and 9 tells us that at least one Meaning of being called is to be called out of darkness into light. Right. To be called from sin and wickedness unto the light of the gospel. To be called out of wickedness unto righteousness, you might say. First Corinthians, we'll turn over there for just a moment. First Corinthians chapter one shows us that there is a, a difference between the, the called and the the unsaved, between the call and the world, if you will. First Corinthians 1, verses 23 and 24, it says, But we preach Christ crucified 
Under the Jews, a stumbling block, and under the Greeks, foolishness. Mm-hmm. He said, but under them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. And to the natural Jew, to the Greek, Christ is offensive, Christ is foolishness. Mm-hmm. So if we've been truly called, he says, it's the power of God. In one other place, he says, it's the power of God and the salvation. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a difference between the true believer, the called, and those who are unsaved, those who are empty professors, you might call them. Right. To them, Christ and the ways of God are foolishness and offensive, but to the called, we realize it is the power of God. Amen. But we can't say that all are the call because there's clearly a difference here in Scripture. Right. Going back to our, our text here in Romans chapter 1, verse number 7, he goes on to say, To all that be in Rome. And here we see Paul addresses his letter to the saints or the saved in Rome. But I don't completely know why sometimes he addresses the saints and other times he addresses the churches. Mm-hmm. Perhaps there were some that he wanted to reach that weren't part of the, the church. Right. But here he says, to all that be in Rome. And Rome is mentioned several times outside of the book of Romans, six times to be exact. Paul, if you remember from our study of his life, he never went to Rome during his missionary journeys, but he did end up in jail there, end up in, on house arrest for two years. Right. Aquila and Priscilla, they were Jews that came from Rome and joined the Corinthian church. During that time, the Jews had been expelled from Rome for mm-hmm. some reason. Obviously, Rome was the capital of the Roman Empire, so it was, yeah, I'd say a big deal that there was a church there. Mm-hmm. It would be the equivalent of us having a, a good sound church in Washington, D.C. Right. And much like our capital, there's much, there was much wickedness in Rome. Exactly. They were very idolatrous. They were wicked people. They practiced paganism. If you know much about Roman mythology, it borrowed greatly from Greek mythology. Right. Perhaps you've heard of the Mercury and Venus and Mars and Saturn and Jupiter and Uranus and Pluto and Neptune. Those are all Greek and Roman gods. Right. In fact, uh, in one place in the book of Acts, Paul and Barnabas were preaching and they thought Barnabas was Jupiter and Paul was Mercury. Right. They said the gods have come down. The, these Romans were very religious, but not in a Christian sense. Mm-hmm. They had their, their gods, and even their unknown god in one place. But they did not, by nature, know the god of the Bible. Right. Really, this is the type of people that were in Rome, especially. Just the fact that there could even be a sound church there really is, just shows that it must be of the grace of God. Amen. It says to all that be in Rome, beloved of God. Here he clarifies who he's referring to as the beloved of God. It is really an indicator that one is saved if they're beloved of God, that they're loved and favored by God. Paul and other other writers often refer to the saints as the beloved of God. Mm-hmm. God himself even calls Christ his beloved son. Amen. So to be called the beloved of God is a, is a great honor, if you will, for the child of God. That God so loved us, that he so favors us, as we'll see throughout the book of Romans and really throughout all of scripture, it's not 
our love towards God, but it's His love towards us that makes a difference. Amen. As First John four nineteen says, we love Him because He first loved us. Right. And He goes on to say, call to be saints. And saints means blameless or morally pure or holy. In fact, the same word is translated holy 153 times in scriptures and 61 times you'll find it as saints. Mm -hmm. It's really just another name for the saved that we are holy in the person of Christ. It's not the Roman Catholic idea of sainthood and veneration as they call it. Mm -hmm. That's they wanted it to, but it's really idolatry. And the person is becomes a quote saint in their teachings. They're worthy of public veneration, or you can come down, bow before them, do your little cross right. before them, pray to them. That's not what saints are, Google. You're right. Amen. And I think sometimes we maybe are afraid to use that term because it's so popular among the Catholics, but to, saints is a common title in scripture for the mm -hmm. people of God. You bet. You know, the saints are not some elite class of believers. It's so just a term for any believer. Right. You hear sometimes in people saying or in music and books and movies, they'll say, well, I'm not a saint. Well, you better be a saint if you want to be right before God. You bet. So to be a saint doesn't mean you're a step above someone else. Only God can make us to be saints or to be holy. Amen. The same word is used to describe Christ as the Holy One of God in four different places. He certainly is the Holy One, but we, saints are the, the little Holy Ones, if you could say it that way. Mm -hmm. We are to be like Christ. In fact, Peter tells us that God said, Be holy as I am holy. Amen. We shouldn't be afraid to be called saints, but we must remember it's not that we're special or elite or anything like that. It just simply means that we are holy in the sight of God. Amen. Going on from there, he concludes this greeting here with his typical greeting to the churches. He says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul uses this same greeting or some slight variation to all the in all his church letters and as well as to Philemon. Mm -hmm. uh, and then to Timothy and Titus, he says, Grace and peace, he wishes them mercy and peace. This is type of reading you'll find in all of what's often referred to as the Pauline epistles. Mm -hmm. It's because the way he words this, we see that Paul knows that grace and peace can only come from God. Mm -hmm. In fact, only through God, or from God the Father through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can't be obtained by some means as the Catholics teach in many of the Protestants. Right. We experience both of these, grace and peace at salvation, but really we experience them all throughout our lives. Right. Amen. Amen. Real quick to Ephesians chapter 2. I know mostly familiar verses to us, but beginning in verse 8 of Ephesians 2, he says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God on his work, as we mentioned both. Here we see grace at salvation. Continue on, we'll go and read through verse 17. He says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Therefore, remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. And that was our natural state. Amen. 
Notice verse 13, he says, But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, or to make in himself a twain one new man, so making peace, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that are were nigh. Amen. He, in Christ, he took us from being in enmity with God and made us at peace with God. And that peace we can never lose as a child of God. Mm -hmm. Just like the grace of salvation we can never lose as a child of God. We, as Paul wishes them grace and peace here, he's not wishing them this grace and peace and salvation, but that they may continually dwell in grace and peace. And that, James 4, 6 tells us that he gives, he giveth more grace, to, for God resists the proud, but he giveth more grace unto the humble. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 26, verse 3 tells us, Thou shalt, thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. And God can, and give grace and peace throughout our lives. Not Amen. just one time deal. And we don't have peace oftentimes because we don't keep our minds stay on Him. We worry about the things of this world, much like, right. much like the disciples did in Christ's ministry. They were always troubled about what was going on around them. But we do the same type of thing and we sacrifice that peace that God offers. You're right. But we will always have peace as far as our relationship towards God. If we are truly born again. Mm -hmm. So we cannot earn grace either, otherwise it would be no more grace. In communion or quote praying the rosary or doing good deeds, none of those things can confer grace to us. Amen. There is this idea among the Catholics and even any of the Protestants that when you take communion you God confers a, some grace to you. Mm -hmm. They say we cannot do anything to earn grace otherwise it's that it would not be grace by the very definition of grace. Amen. Amen. And only God can give true peace. We won't turn over Romans three seventeen says when he's describing the depravity of man, he tells us that and cannot understand the of peace. So the way of peace has to be found. 1 Thessalonians 5 3 describes the peace that man understands. Amen. And he said, When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. That's it. Well, man might know about a, a peaceful time, but they don't know about the peace that comes from God. A man may enjoy peace for a little season, but it doesn't ever last. But good peace that comes from God is everlasting. Amen. And this grace and peace can only be from God through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can't we can't put it in the hands of the church because it's not the church's responsibility to give. Mm -hmm. It's not the pastor or the priest's responsibility or authority even to give. They can only be found in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We truly want grace and peace. That's the only means which, by which you can seek it. Well, we're going to finish up with that, and Lord willing, next week we'll look, look at how, as you might say, how strong is your faith, Lord willing. Amen.